Dear friends and colleagues, this is um, the final keynote of um, this wonderful conference in Budapest. Now, the man sitting next to me uh, just became an associate professor <laughs> yesterday. <so. laughs> and once you become an associate professor, you can change titles of your lectures. So, um, the, the, the title of his lecture is now simply Disaster Justice. So, um, Christian Nauta is. Um, affiliated to the uh, University of Copenhagen in, in Denmark. He's a lawyer. You heard that yesterday when he posed one of his relevant and pertinent questions. So thanks um, for having you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the applause. I couldn't think of a better way of starting this um, presentation. So. My name is Christian. I am from the University of Copenhagen. I've been enrolled in this network for the entirety and had a great fun discussing with a lot of you. And I'm sure that some of you have heard at least part of what I'm going to tell you today. Nonetheless, bear with me. I realize also that I am now what stands between you people and weekend. So I'll try to be pretty uh, concise with my argument. I'm affiliated to a number of different things, as you can see, changing disasters in COPE. Please check it out. We have a lot of very interesting disaster research going on at the University of Copenhagen. Okay, let's go. Ready? So, March 11th, 2011, at a quarter to three, an uh, undersea megathrust earthquake happened outside the coast of Japan. It was a magnitude nine earthquake, pretty much which makes it probably the third strongest earthquake ever registered by a seismograph, and by far the worst earthquake ever registered in Japan. It created a 40.5 meter tsunami hitting the coast of Japan. 40.5 meters, just to give you an impression. St. Stephen's Basilica down here, it's 96 meters, so it's pretty much kind of halfway up to the top tower of uh, the cathedral. 15,894 people died, and 2,582 were reported missing. This was, by any measure, a display of the forcefulness of nature, the overwhelming strength of the world we live in. Yet, afterwards, that's not how it was understood and interpreted in Japan. Afterwards, it was named a disaster made in Japan. We've seen searches of legal cases against public officials, against the, obviously, the directors of TEPCO, the nuclear power plant, against neighbors, um, against pretty much anything you can imagine. So, I'm going to talk about this phenomenon today. Disaster responsibility, the idea about justice tied to disasters. And I'm going to do so in three overall arguments. The first argument is pretty simple, I think. So the first argument should also be known to most of you, which is disasters are social processes. And accordingly, they are a matter for justice and law. Okay. The second arguments are that, therefore, conflicts regarding responsibility, justice, and all rights are playing out globally right now. They are playing out in very different cultural, societal, economic contexts. However, we can say something common about all of these conflicts coming out of discussions about responsibility and rights in disaster situations. And thirdly, which I hope will be the controversial part that will keep you awake throughout my talk, that law in general and courts in particular are created to deal with two of these commonalities, but one of the commonalities I'll identify remain highly controversial. I'll get back to which one and hopefully which will be the take home of this talk. Are you cool with, uh, with this? Let's go. So, originally in European thinking and European history, disasters were conceived as acts of God. God's wrath God's sense of justice being exercised over human beings. Disasters were therefore something per definition exterior to us. There was nothing we could do about it. 
The only thing we could do as humans was to try to soothe God's wrath, either by punishing sinners, burning witches, whatever we could find, or by changing the way we lived to live in accordance with God. After the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, you had people in churches all across Europe preaching about how the ways of life in Lisbon was horrible and the reason for this misfortune. But the essence of what a disaster was, was that exactly. Disasters were justice. They were God's implementation of justice, not necessarily something we could understand or interpret in the right way. However, they were the essence of justice. So, 1755, as most of you know, if you know your history of ideas, became a turning point for this kind of way of thinking about disasters as, um, you know, Leibniz theodicy idea, God put on trial, claiming that everything is right, all there is in the world is in fact good, we just don't understand it. Voltaire, Rousseau, a number of Enlightenment thinkers challenges this and asks, listen, listen, you can't seriously argue that the people of Lisbon should be worse than the people of London or Paris. It makes no sense. Rather, disasters are not the justice of God. Disasters are part of a contingent world. We live in a world where things happen all the time and a violent nature is part of it. We cannot foresee this nature, so we have to deal with it best possibly. 1755 is, besides being this kind of enlightenment breakthrough, also mentioned as the first state-coordinated disaster response ever in the world history. So with this change of what a disaster is, rather than the will of God to a contingent nature, our role vis-a-vis -vis disasters changes entirely. However, disasters are still force majeures, right? It's nature. Going back to Japan, what the hell should we do? It's a 40.5 meter tsunami. It's the biggest earthquake we've ever seen. There's no way in hell we could do anything against that. However, a modern idea of disasters that we've seen developing the last 80 year, again, kind of changes what a disaster is. And the modern idea of a disaster is disasters as social vulnerability. It's the disaster is basically caused by us, by the way we live, by choosing to live in coastal areas in Japan, by choosing to have a nuclear power plant on the coastline, close to a fault line. We choose to impose risk on our own lives and our fellow human beings. So modern disasters are in fact always caused by us. It ref kind of flips the whole idea of disaster um, uh, around and leaves us with the fact that disasters are our own creations caused by us. Um, I guess you get this, right? You've all read disaster research. Just a contemporary example nonetheless. Haiti earthquake, 2010, probably the worst disaster we've seen in the last 10 years. Up to 200,000 people died in this horrific earthquake. What is perhaps little known is that a fortnight after the Haiti earthquake, a 500 times stronger earthquake took place in Chile, basically exposing the same number of people in urban areas for pretty much the same kind of natural hazard. However, in Chile, though the disaster was violent, there's, afterward, there's been discussions about tsunami alert and so on, 500 people died. They managed that disaster entirely different, showing to us that it's not about nature that's not the disaster anyways. The disaster is the way we, as a society, are able to accommodate for these risks that we're posed. Some of you might have followed international news, Ray Japan, in the last couple of weeks where we've had a series of earthquakes. Same kind of story, right? Imagine a series of earthquakes similar to the ones in Japan taking place in Budapest. This city would not stand. However, because the Japanese society, to such a large extent, have accommodated their society to withstand earthquakes. They're not there anymore. So, okay. This is all very well, if we can all agree thus far. 
something entirely different happens with this change of what a disaster is. Because when a disaster stops being caused by external, uncontrollable, contingent forces and start becoming our own fault, the fact that we did not accommodate differently for our society, the fact that we did not build that levy or make a, a construction code, it has major implications for the issue of justice. And I'll just introduce, I'm not a philosopher, so beat me up, but I'll introduce a simple political philosophical distinction to actually help this understanding some of the way. And that's a horrible picture. Anyways, Judith Shaklar, some of you might be familiar with her work, all excellent, all super mind provocative. One of them is this, The Faces of Injustice, a series of essays about injustice. And what she says, I find incredibly useful to describe what's going on. She says, all bad things in the world are categorized either as a misfortune or an injustice. Think about it. Everything that happens to you in your life, you either categorize as a misfortune or an injustice. And Jacquard tells us this distinction is not a natural distinction, obviously. So what we consider something that comes from, um, so what we consider something that is inherent in the world has nothing to do with this distinction. In fact, this distinction is made up by a puzzle in which our preferences, status, perspective, and political ideology are all implicated. For Shaklar, she uses the example of being a woman. While being a woman was originally a misfortune. Yes, you were born a woman, thus you were mistreated. There's nothing you can do about it. It became an injustice at some point. Someone said, this cannot be right. In fact, I'm not treated differently from men because nature made it that way. I'm treated differently from men because of preferences, status, perspective, and political ide ideology, all things we can change and address, thus becoming an injustice. See, what is happening to disasters are that they, in the old paradigms, in the idea of disasters as God or disasters as nature, they were misfortunes. Per definition, they were misfortunes. For us, as human beings, we could not influence the forces of nature. However, when disasters become social vulnerability, they become potential injustices. We start hearing, in the words of Shekla, the voices of the sense of injustice. And while this has huge implications, of course, for the reason why we are gathered here today, why we even talk about ethics and disasters and justice, it has perhaps even bigger implications for a system, of course, closely related to morality, namely law. Because this means, I'll claim in a little bit, that our fundamental idea of how we should regulate and who can be responsible, what accountability means, are shifting. As they become fundamental injustices, we start looking for these causal links who was it, in fact, that built that levy that made my house flood and not my neighbors? Why did the mayor not tell me that there was this risk since we know it was there? And it changes our society entirely. It builds in ideas of risk into everyday life, creates transparency and forces, I would say, thoroughly kind of a juridification of disasters, creating disaster law. Okay, so in order to convince you about this, I'll just tell you about some of the legal things that's going on in the world. So let's move on to the second argument, namely these conflicts that now arise from the hearing the sense of injustice, they regard responsibility, justice and rights. They're playing out all over the world. And even though they're very different in terms of whether they go on in India, in South America, or in Denmark, those conflicts have something in common that I'll return to. But first, let me try and convince you about the fact that they play out all over the world. 
This is a picture that um, most of you probably know. I, yeah, well, I don't know if you actually do. Doesn't matter. This is from Hurricane Katrina. Following Hurricane Katrina, one million legal claims were raised of all sorts of different natures, of all sorts of different kinds, against all sorts of different people. Most prominently was a case that I shall return to, a case regarding the Corps of Engineers in the, in the US and their construction of the levee system. This is a picture from France, 28th of February 2010. Cyclone Cynthia struck French coast, 29 people died. This particular case regarded, of, it flooded hundreds of homes, and this particular conflict regarded the fact that the mayor's son was the person who had uh, got, got the right out of, we don't know how exactly, to build in a so-called red zone near the coast. So the mayor's son got the rights to build houses um, with a beautiful sea view next to the marina. However, with this devastating result, the mayor was sentenced to four years imprisonment, as were her son. So, and perhaps the most prominent and infamous example of all of them, the L'Aquila trial involving six researchers and one public official's responsibility for an earthquake in L'Aquila, Italy in 2009. The case regarded, okay, I'll also return to that in a little bit. But these cases regards not only what we could call vertical, no. I, yeah, you know, that's one of those things that's becoming an associate, associate professor does not help me with. Horizontal, these, <laughs> these issues regards not only horizontal justice, that is justice between people already recognized as subject in a society, distributive justice issues. It also regards vertical justice, that is who are subjects, who are in fact eligible to get protection under the law. So, oh, oh, that was a bit surprising. Here we are. So, who's inside and who's outside uh, the legal framework? And I'll just give you one case on this and then I shall return to the overall argument, just try and convince you. So, this position is Chernaus in the southern part of Russia. Chernaus is a small mining village, old mining village. Um, with approximately 25,000 people living there. Looks like this in real life. So, besides being probably a really boring and very non-touristy place in Russia, this is also an incredibly vulnerable place. As you can sense from this picture, the reason I chose it is it's positioned between very steep mountain slopes. And this means that in the summertime, pretty much, every summer since Tionaus was built, this city is exposed to so-called mudslides. And I usually show a video here because people who don't know what a mudslide is tend to think that it sounds, you know, how bad can it be? So let me just assure you that a mudslide is bloody serious business. It's basically a flood of mud taking everything with it on its way and destroying everything it can. It's an incredibly powerful um, natural phenomenon. So, in the summer of 1999, the citizens of Turnaus had a series of incredibly violent mudslides. And what these mudslides did was they, they utterly destroyed the defenses they had built for 50 years. One of them being a mud retention dam, which is basically a big block of cement you put up <laughs> to make sure that the mud doesn't flow with full strength towards the city. So, in the year between 1999 and 2000, the citizens of Tjernaus desperately tried to convince the local government to do something. They said, listen, we know every bloody summer there will be a mudslide, please do something. And both the local government, the state government and the federal government of Russia denied to do anything, knowing that there was a significant risk of a huge mudslide taking place the following summer. And rightly so, 
In the summer of 2000, a series of mudslides utterly covered Trianaus in mud, killing at least seven people. A number of people disappeared. All houses destroyed, livelihood, and all other things. The, city of, the citizens of Trianaus was left with the question, which is, are we in fact legal subjects? Are we in fact under the protection of Russia with they can regard such a risk? And they decided to make it a legal question, namely whether they had the right as individuals to be protected from such an obvious risk under the European Convention on Human Rights. Whether, in other words, Russia had an obligation to either warn these people, provide information, evacuate them, any sort of strategy that would mitigate this horrible risk, and they were successful. They won a case in Strasbourg in 2008, establishing that in fact, in these blatant examples of negligence from public officials, you have a right as a citizen to be protected from natural hazards, or at least be informed of the risks. In other words, law is here not only used as a medium to discuss distribution among the people already acknowledged as people we should protect, but it also is a mean of establishing who should be protected. In this case, a boring, sleepy little mining city in the southern part of Russia was in fact individuals having the right to individual protection from natural hazards. So now I've messed up the slides a little bit, so please bear with me, I'll just roll back here. To <laughs> this one. So just to convince you, I had a student do this before coming, just to give you an, a brief idea of cases, prominent legal cases the last 10 years. But I can assure you, any major disaster happening in Europe or anywhere else in the world, the last 10 years has resulted in legal dispute afterwards. Social conflict where people basically claim that they've been unjustly treated, becoming legal cases. Good. With that in mind, let me tell you something general about these legal cases, which I think will describe all of them. So, these cases differ from other typical cases, I think by three things I've been able to identify. Please help me if you have ideas for more. The first one is they're incredibly complex in causality. So establishing who did what is super complex. In a size like a society where with disastrous results, it's difficult to tell whether the loss of the plaintiff was in fact caused by, um, by general regulation or by failure by local community, by failure by your neighbors, by failure on your own behalf to do something, and so on. So these cases all regard different, difficult causality, causal links between plaintiff's loss and defendant's guilt. So the example of that, of course, is L'Aquila. So let's just get, on, get, get that on the table. Are you all familiar with the case in L'Aquila? Or should I just give you a little brush up? OK, sh short brush up. A week, no. In 2009, they had a series of, they had a so-called swarm of earthquakes taking place in L'Aquila in central Israel. A swarm of earthquake is kind of a constant simmer where you feel small shakes all the time, and that had been going on for three months. What happened in L'Aquila was that a local um, geologist developed a theory that he started to spread. And that theory was that this swarm of earthquakes were in fact a forewarning of a major earthquake coming in just a minute. And people obviously started to panic. Because when you have earthquakes normally, you have a natural warning system, four shakes, which means that every time you feel a shake, you know something big is coming in a minute, so you can do something. You have a window to do something. But in a swarm of earthquakes, you don't. You can't tell what is, in fact, part of the swarm of earthquakes and what is a four shake. So the local community decided to call in what is called the National Risk Committee. 
in Italy. The National Risk Committee was consistent of the leading seismologists in Italy, as well as one of the leaders from the Civil Protection Agency. And their role was to advise public authorities on natural risks. So they were gathered in, in L'Aquila, where they had an hour's meeting. In that meeting, we know from the agenda, or sorry, from the, from the notes from the meeting, in that meeting, they established that there was a small risk of a major earthquake taking place. There was a small residual risk. However, the swarm of earthquake, in fact, lowered the risk of a major earthquake taking place. At the press conference, immediately after, where the public official and the scientists were sitting in front of the public, they said the following, there are no risk of a major earthquake taking place. And asked directly by one of the journalists, the public official, whether what they should do when they filled a force shake. The chairman of this committee said, I would recommend this very good local red wine Open it, take your favorite cozy chair, and just enjoy it. Just enjoy the ride. Exactly one week after this press conference, a major earthquake utterly destroyed L'Aquila, killing 307 people and injuring 1,100 people. So the relatives of 27 of the people affected dead, dying in this earthquake claimed afterwards that they had not evacuated their houses because they had been assured a week before by the leading seismologist of this country that there were absolutely no risk of this happening. They did not react as they would have in other circumstances because of what the scientists had said. And here, of course, comes the issue of causality because solving out whether it was the scientist's advice, whether it was complacency, whether it was something happening on news, is difficult business. They managed to do so in L'Aquila and found them guilty, at least in the first instance, of involuntary manslaughter. Seven years imprisonment, they were, the scientists, acquitted on appeal. However, just to let you know, I'm going to use L'Aquila as the example now, because otherwise we won't have time for anything else. So, causality is always an issue in these cases. Always figuring out whether exactly the defendant's contribution were the thing that happened. The other thing that's common with all of these cases across countries, across borders, is they all regard serious losses. They all regard people who have lost their life or livelihood. and with this desperate loss or serious loss comes a number of biases in these types of cases. There's a huge risk of scapegoating. There's a huge risk of revenge motives and overreactions because we're in a situation where you've basically lost everything you own. On the other hand, this puts another kind of pressure or another kind of characteristic on these cases. They're all incredibly important for social peace and cohesion. They're all super important to settle in order to create some sort of meaning out of what actually went on and thereby to justice. However, there's a third and I think most important characteristic with most of these cases. And I also think that's what makes them so bloody controversial. Maybe, you tell me. They all, almost all of them, touches upon the boundaries between law and other fields, other realms of the world. They touch upon the boundaries between law and science, between law and politics, between law and economic, between law and expertise of all kinds. L'Aquila is the obvious example of scientific discretion and law. We could use Katrina as a perfect example of political discretion or executive uh, discretion, choosing not to build the levee in a way so that the people of New Orleans are safe, choosing that it was the people of, in Ninth Ward that should suffer the consequence, is on a fine balance between negligence 
and just bad political priority. And yeah, so, and the same goes obviously with morality. What I'm trying to say with this is that all of these cases does not only regards law's interior, but also its exterior boundaries towards other realms of the world. What we as democracies can decide, what you as scientists can talk about. So that moves me on to my third argument, which is while law in general and courts in particular are created to deal with complex causality and desperate losses. In fact, I would claim we have legal systems put in place primarily to deal with these issues. They're not put in place to deal with the external boundaries or the exterior boundaries of law. And this creates, I think, huge challenges for law and for politics, morality, and science ahead. So, here comes the controversial argument. Most people, when criticizing law and adjudication of responsibility after disasters, fail to criticize their own realms. I don't, law and social conflict following disaster will inevitably follow. We'll have these dispute about justice, injustice and responsibility and rights no matter what we do. What it puts pressure on is the political realm's ability to identify what is in fact a political decision, a democratic decision, and what is something which is more of an administrative character. And it puts a lot of pressure on scientists to say, this I know, and this I don't know. And while this pressure can be criticized, obviously, for being enforced by courts, by non-elected judges sitting in a courtroom with legal training and no democratic uh, legitimacy, I think we could also point the arrow the other way and criticize the political system and the sciences for the lack of ability to do so. Basically, for the lack of ability to actually deal with these fundamental issues in our society. This kind of conflicts, I will claim, descriptively, will only increase in the future. And I think courts are, to a very, very large extent, able to deal with them and thus enforce what we could call one aspect of disaster justice throughout the world. And I think they're doing an important and um, incredibly essential task for society. However, by doing so, they continuously put pressure on the other realm's ability to clarify what is in fact certain knowledge, what is in fact a political prioritization, and what is just a big screw up. And even that, I would say, is a good pressure to put on the other realms. So since I've basically lost you all already, I'll just do a, a little commercial if you're interested in this. I have a book out, Disaster Law. It's uh, very good. And end with, uh, <laughs> and end with Metallica. Thank you for uh, hanging on there. You look dead tired, all of you. Sorry. <laughs> I managed to kill you. Sorry. Thanks. You didn't kill us? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Not at all. I, I, I no, can tell no, the people no. are dying here. No, no. Yeah. Not at all. Thank you so much. It's been very inspiring to me, and I guess I'm not speaking for my own. Of course, there will be questions. We still have, let's say, for about 15 to 20 minutes left. Um, just wait until the mic has arrived, or Peter with the mic to pose a question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for the fascinating and uh, very interesting overview. Um, and the argument, of course. Uh, I just have one question. Go. Um, one of the issues that we're dealing with here is actually low probability, high impact risk. And right. the issues that you're raising with regard to state responsibility, and I mean state in the broader sense of, of the term, not only federal responsibility, but local governments, uh, regional governments, or federal governments' responsibility, has a lot to do with actually 
the same question, pretty much the same question as we are grappling with in the ethics of risk uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. So how to deal with low probability, high impact risk. Uh, no wall in Fukushima would have avoided the tsunami to pass the wall, so that could not have been avoided as such. Perhaps other things could have been changed in the reactor design. Yeah. Uh, so the generators shouldn't be in the basement, but the flood wall could never be tall enough to, to avoid for that. Yeah. So uh, wh where do you think that a state responsibility would actually would cease to exist or would r be reduced or would you have this kind of gradual view about that or is it an absolute state responsibility? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, because the L'Aquila example is a very fascinating example and the, the statements done were actually scientifically, let's say, unsound. Yeah. So, they I mean, no risk doesn't exist at they, all. They were lying. They, they, they told something they knew were wrong, right? Exactly. They, they were but other good examples, old school lying. Yeah, th we do have a lot of these actually typical examples. Reactors are still on, on uh, on the, on the river shores yep. for the yep. very understandable reasons that you need access to water. Okay, yeah, good question. Um, low probability, high impact events, the whole black swan, fat tail discussion, how should we deal with things that are fundamentally unforeseeable and underlying, I guess, there is a tendency to hindsight bias in all of these things, right? When something has happened, we're like, ha, I knew that. Um, and why didn't you react to it? Or finding the one statement among the 10,000 voices before saying, <laughs> the, you know, yeah, yeah, I saw it, I knew it, totally knew it. Um, I'm, let me start off by saying I'm not advocated f advocating full responsibility for anything. The only thing I'm advocating for is to say courts are in fact dealing with these dilemmas in a number of different eras already. Another different realms. They deal with uh, low probability, high impact events in traffic. They deal with it uh, in uh, flight modes, in industrial activities. It's, I think we can quite safely trust courts to do that. They're super conservative even. So it's not like they will uh, attach responsibility for something where you can actually prove there is a low probability, high impact event. The only thing I would say is I, I think that question is pretty safe within the realms of law. People are super conservative and would never attach responsibility for something that was fundamentally unforeseeable. And what I also want to say is, I don't think we should protect against all natural hazards or that we should live in a perfectly safe environment. Not at all. But I damn want to force those scientists and politicians to tell us what the risks are. So we can make informed, democratic, political choices. And if they don't, I want them to be responsible for that. I want them to be responsible for withholding information that could have affected me differently, where I could have taken different choices based on that. So in fact, I would say law is on the one hand a frontier for disaster justice, but it also becomes a frontier for forcing this transparency. I think accountability might be one of the most important ethical is things we want to we want to add to any sort of disaster intervention, because accountability forces you to critically assess what you do all the time, and it forces you to cover your ass. And I want our politicians to cover their ass. I want them to tell me that there is a one percent chance that we're not going to do anything about that I'll flood. Then I can make my own choices. Okay, thank you. Questions for president, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> it was like un Lauter, Lauter Uncle 16. Sam pointing Lauter at you. 16. Like, yeah, great. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Esther Koller from Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, so you talked about, I, I want to go back to point one. You Please. talked about um, our changing conception of disasters as social vulnerability. And I was wondering that it seems to me that there's only so much we can do given our current level of resources and technology. So it seems to me better to think of disasters as having a component of social vulnerability, but always having this residual natural component that still remains within the realm of misfortune. Yeah. So my question is, um, and not only there's a residual natural component, but there's also other legitimate social purposes to which we should dedicate our resources and technology. So then the question is, is there a duty or some social responsibility um, to push the limits of, of the social vulnerability component as far as possible? And if so, then... then a duty for who? 
on, on the part of the state or the mm. community, the mm. social responsibility there. Um, and if so, to what extent and, and how to deal with this, mm -hmm. these, these mm. fine lines mm -hmm. here. And, um, yeah, um, so I, I realize I, I sound a little bit Anthropocene somehow, right? Almost kind of breaking the whole, there's no, there's no natural environment, we're all, it's all human creations. It's one big garden now. There's no such thing as nature. Um, that's not what I mean. That's not what I mean. I, I, I don't want to stretch the argument that far at all. I just want to say that the way we interpret and deal with disasters, the way we study disasters today in disaster research, is from a presumption that we should have done differently. And that that presumption triggers automatically this kind of sense of injustice. It automatically, and I honestly, I think it's a dysfunction. I don't think that disaster research has made this change in order for us to see this or create this kind of frenzy for justice and, and, and jur juridification. But, but, but it happens nonetheless. And I think it's, I think it actually is um, like a gestalt switch, is that what it's called? Kind of uh, a change of tile perception. It's a paradigm shift. We, we can't turn back now. And so, what is left then? I think what is left is, again, an obligation on behalf of states to clearly state what they consider risks they should deal with and what they consider risks beyond their responsibility. Uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is I think there is, with accountability comes an obligation to have a political discussion, continuous political discussion on the boundaries of the state's responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the individual. And I can only encourage that. And that discussion, from my perspective, would be wonderful if we included discussions on what is in fact something that comes from nature and what comes from human society. And when, at this point, people would normally say, listen, <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> I know our politicians. They are not even able to, you know, discuss social benefits in a society. How do you want them to discuss these lines? And then we transcend, I think, my argument, because then it becomes a discussion about our governance system as such and its ability to deal <clears throat> with the challenges. It's actually confronted with climate change, all these things. And I can personally agree with that criticism, but I think that becomes then a criticism of democracy and its abilities to actually deal with the challenges we have. Uh, and. I think that's a little bit beyond what I do anyways. Yeah. Did that make sense at all? Mm -hmm. That was a long answer. Thank you. Okay. Iskra? May I? Go. Sure. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> what you would do with this information if I tell you as a state that you are living in, um, I don't know, historic houses uh, in the very center of the city and in major earthquake you will be the first breaking down your houses, <laughs> what would you do with this information? Would it be like an excuse after the earthquake for the state for not giving you, I don't know, financial help for rebuilding your building? So, what would I do? Yeah. Well, I at least have the opportunity to do something to safeguard my life, first and foremost. Secondly, I'm not saying if, that was, if that's what indicated that it stops being a question of justice when the state tells you that you're in danger. In fact, I think that's where it becomes visible for most people as a question of justice. Not as something exposed afterwards, but something already before we can discuss whether it's just that the state will not protect your house on that mountain ridge or not. And that's what I want to force. In fact, I would say by telling you, we visualize the discussion about accountability and responsibility and enables us to have a discussion about it, which is not the case today. This is something that happens <clears throat> afterwards, after you've already lost your beautiful mountain house and your entire family. And I think that's the huge problem. That's the structural injustice at hand. So if I were living on a mountain ridge, I would much prefer the ability to act on this, both as a political agent and as a family father, before the disaster than after. Is that a satisfactory answer, or did I avoid the real question? You look a little skeptical. Maybe use the mic if you want. 
saying Iskra, yes, we, have, we have in Zagreb, for example, this map saying that you have zones mm -hmm. that will be collapse in big earthquake. And Zagreb uh, has experience uh, with big earthquake in 1880. So with this information, what I will get, we already know that all of us living in the very center of the city are in Danger. parts mm -hmm. that are very endangered mm -hmm. with uh, earthquakes. So what I should do or what they should do? They probably should want stabilize these buildings. Yeah. They, they really need a lot of money. They will say what? Don't buy these apartments having economic catastrophe and we mm -hmm. really don't know will this earthquake happen again. So mm -hmm. creating uh, some kind of panic. But don't you think that's a political problem as well? Because what I'm saying is I want that to be a political problem. Mm -hmm. I want that to be a polit I want that to transcend the realm of whether the state has an obligation to do so. I want that to be a discussion in the community whether we should liberalize that risk, whether you should carry it because you have that house, or it's something we should share as a community. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a question not of law, but of political ideology, of political communities' ability to address these issues. And that's what I want, because I think that's the responsible part of it. And as long as we don't do that, We'll have legal cases for sure. Because what I think, what my, my sense is that politicians lack the guts to tell you. They lack the guts to tell you that if there is a big earthquake, your house will be destroyed. Okay, or I and they use the legal a system. higher insurance, insurance rate. Yeah, but that's, then, that's, a political, that's a question of political accommodation then, right? You have the discussion in the US right now with the flood insurance. You have a federal flood insurance program in the U.S. Um, you have the discussion on whether when you uh, make new flood risks and ri But no matter what, it becomes a political discussion how you should deal with this distribution of wealth. And I think distribution of wealth in a community is a political question and not a legal question. I think that's where it belongs. And I think by not tackling this within the realm of politics, you force it to become a legal question. Law is challenged to define, redefine its exterior boundaries and do something which I consider to be a fundamentally political decision. And I think that's super dysfunctional. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Who is honored to pose the final question? Better be a tricky one. Oh yeah. Now I put pressure on everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't dare to pose the final question. Everyone's satisfied? Thank you once more, Associate Professor Christian. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>